And it's live. I'm uh, sitting here with uh, Eric on MEM tips and tricks, and we are going to look at some application automation. And uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you, Matthias. How are you doing? Very, yeah, I'm very good. Sitting here in Denmark, uh, actually went on Christmas vacation, but uh, I saw your uh, very, very cool work on, on a blog post, and I thought I need to do a interview with you. Cool. Thanks. So, how's how's the weather in Denmark? Are you do you have snow or is it freezing? Ah, it's been the most beautiful sunshine today. Uh, we've had so far six hours of sunshine in December month. So mm -hmm. every hour where we have sunshine, it's going out and enjoy the sun. But yeah. no snow, unfortunately. So that's uh, how Denmark is, and I I, I believe. Uh, we get snow some thing around every seventh year or something. It's it's not like Norway where you actually come from. No, actually in Norway, I think they do have snow now. That but but I think it's going to go away now when when Christmas arrives. But now I live in Brazil, so here it's like you know, 32 degrees, 24/7, 365. Wow! You can just throw that. I'm on the beach and. I remember I did a automation class in uh, Copenhagen, and I didn't have any cold, cold clothes here in Brazil, right? Because I've been living here for the last 11 years. <laughs> so actually here we have a special store that only sell uh, clothes when you're going abroad to, to uh, a cold place. You know? Okay. Oh, but they only have one, so so it's very expensive. So I think I bought a jacket for like five hundred dollars, and I've used it once. Yeah, <laughs> and I went to Denmark, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, when when you when you come visit, you you must buy some clothing, so so you have for the next trip, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you live in Brazil now, and and as I hear, for eleven years now going on, and as I as I read your name. I, I know that is Norwegian because uh, Hovastein, right? Exactly. So we have the strange character, the A with the uh, with the zero about it. Huh? So it's Hoverstein when you talk with foreigners, but since I'm, you know, I'm working mostly with people in the U.S., so it's it's just Eric makes it easier for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. It's it goes the same for my uh, last name. I have. Uh, I am married with a, a, a Norwegian name, Kalvog, and I had my original Melkerson, which both are Norwegians. So, yeah, what are the odds, you know? Yeah, just Matthias, that's, you know. Matthias and or Matthias or Matthew <laughs> or whatever works, uh, it's fine by me. So living in, in, in Brazil, I mean, how, how did, was it uh, something, uh, was there a girl or did you just exactly. think Norway, it's it's too boring, I need to go to Brazil? Okay, so what happened is, you know, I've been working in IT since the uh, last 20 years, uh, mostly with a uh, remoting system, that being uh, Citrix mainly. And so I've been doing that for a lot of time. And in 99, when, you know, the kite surfing stuff arrived, I started doing kite surfing. And at that time, I also went to the U.S. each and every year for Tech Ed or Civic Summit or whatever that was called then. So what I used to do was fly to Miami, Orlando, and then I flew to the, the Dominican Republic, that is. Uh -huh. And that was one of the best, well, actually the best place in the world to do kite surfing. So, you know, I spent one week in, in Orlando for the conferences, then I spent two weeks in the Caribbean doing kite surfing, and then I Ooh. went back. That's how it started out doing kite surfing, and that at that time in '99 was when you know the kite surfing stuff started to kick off. Mm -hmm. I did that for a couple of years. Uh, joined another company, met a friend there. He had a passion for kiting as well, so we traveled a lot together. And then once in the Caribbean, it was like, wow. Two weeks is not enough. Let's do two months or three months or whatever. And he was like, let's just buy a sailboat, right? <laughs> so we actually went down to Spain. We had never sailed in our life, except for, for small boats. And uh, we did a, a course for one week in Spain. 
And then we bought a, a sailboat in the Caribbean and the French got loopies. So we flew over and we spent two years in the Caribbean. Uh, the plan was one year. Uh, after six months, we were drinking uh, uh, Cuba Libre in Havana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know about you, but I'm going to stay another year. And I was like, OK, me too. Cheers. So we ended up staying two years, traveling around the world. And, uh, and then at, at that time, we spent a lot of time in, in Venezuela. I think I lived there for like nine months. So I learned Spanish there. And then we went to Colombia, Mexico, all, 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 all over the Caribbean. So the funny thing was the boss would let me go to, you know, he gave me a one, one year leave so I could come back. But since we did it for two years, then I had to quit my job, right? Mm. So they cannot, you know, decide what's, what's going to happen in the future. Mm. So I came back, had a lunch meeting with him and started working the next day. So I was back in business. But then the, the game has changed because the beach in, in Republic of Dominican is very small and we went to Venezuela a lot of time, and now the new hotspot was in Brazil, Fortaleza, where I'm actually living now. So wow. I went over here uh, with my wife to become, uh, travel here like, you know, three, four times a year, did, you know, 50-50 work, doing holiday and doing working in the morning. Uh, I started my blog, I started my training to have, a, you know, an extra income, and I went to the bus again, which uh, let me go to the Caribbean and I told them, well, I want to, I want to live in Brazil. Okay, no problem. So I actually ended up living in, living and working for a Norwegian company in Brazil for more than three or four years, I think. Okay. Then they let me go. They had some re-instruction, uh, re, what do you know, yeah. reorganization stuff in, in, uh, in Ergo Group at that time, or whatever it's called now, and probably there was some boss wondering who's this crazy guy we're paying down in Brazil. So that let me go, and mm. uh, and I just focused more on on the blog. I got a lot of sponsors on board that did more training. Mm. After that training business, you know, went down. People don't have time for doing training anymore. So, and then I decided, you know. Let me just start doing consulting again. And since I've been doing my blog so long, I had you know an email list of like 10, 50,000 users. So I just blasted out an email and lucky me, I got a contract and I've been there ever since. So hmm. now I'm working full time uh, with a US company. Wow. And lucky, lucky to have uh, Adam Gross, MVP, as my colleague. So it's going, uh, yeah. So, doing, I, uh, so when I started in, in this company, I was mainly doing Citrix automation. We automate everything. You know, we have tons of mass images spread across the world. So, we, you know, did all that kind of stuff automatically. And then there was a, a, a position in Adam's team because he became a supervisor. And we have a lot of apps that we need to convert to next year. So, you know, I basically went back to where I started out because in the early days, I did Citrix, but then I did uh, application certification for the Citrix platform. So we had packages coming in from India, where the package team was sitting, and I was the one, you know, certifying those apps to make sure they was working in a multi-session environment. And now I'm actually I'm, I'm back in the app business. And when I started out, that was like, okay, there's a lot of step you need to do in SSF to create a package. Oh, and you know, I'm I'm all about automation, so I jumped on that, and that's how you know that we got started. And then there was an opening in Adam's team, and I joined that. And now it's you know it's apps 24/7, mm. and that's why I released uh, this blog post uh, that caught your attention. Oh yes, but you caught my attention uh, long before that, and and you know that because I've several times I've wrote I wrote you. I need to see this, Eric. I need. To, I, you need to. Show, you need to show me this. <laughs> yeah. So, really interesting. Uh, you are in the same area as I am, and and it was actually Adam who who uh, who helped me uh, along on on the MEP for 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 myself. So, I um, I owe him a big beer once I see him personally. Um, so cool to uh, to work with him uh, every day. Um, 
So I, I feel the pain about applications and in, in, in config manager, yes, applications, they were. Uh, when I started in, in, in that business, it was uh, just creating a package with collections, programs at advertisements. It was uh, 84 clicks per app for a install and an un uninstall command. And it was like, this needs to be automized. And, and so we did. We actually created a, a, a tool that we put up on uh, Config Manager, which were called Software Central. And it's, 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 it still uh, lives out there uh, in a lot of uh, customer um, um, uh, cost, uh, Config Managers. And, and, and now, I mean, there, there needs to be some something helping Intune as well uh, on that transition, you know, from Config Manager to to the cloud because it is a pain point where people really have been adding a lot of time and a lot of effort and money uh, on the application part. As you said, you are uh, automating this stuff, and 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 in order to transition from 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 the Config Manager to the cloud and start using autopilot and all that stuff we need to be more automized in how we can can do this stuff and that's why why your block really caught my attention because that is where i really want to to improve um so uh, so yeah uh, i mean there are lots of uh, applications uh, today that goes into the store or we have WinGet or uh, other kind of, of formats where, where formerly we, we did everything in MSI and what it was not in MSIs, we were repackaging to MSI, but but that's that's a technology that's from 2000. So so it's, it's pretty mature, you could say, uh, or maybe it's, yeah, too mature maybe. Uh, so, We've had AppV and we have had MSIX and we have SIMFS and we have um, uh, v VH, uh, uh, VHD um, that goes into to Azure Virtual Desktop, right? So we have a lot of um, application formats that we need in our new way of working. So, so, so my thought you could say with this was to, okay, how can we do this more easily for our Windows uh, 365 platforms, for our Azure Virtual Desktop, for our Windows 10 desktops, for our Windows 11 desktops, etc. in the cloud. And that's where, yeah, you know, application automation comes in. And uh, Eric, I've seen some quite amazing stuff from your hand. And... Cool. Uh, yeah, and I really would like us to to dig into that demo and and see what awesome stuff you are creating. Sure. So, want me to share my screen? Yes, sir. That one. Yeah, that looks like Notepad++. Yeah, that's correct. So, where do we start? So let me see if I have. We have a lot of packages we can show, but we can, you know, explain the difference between the EXI and the MSI. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have an MSI. Okay, so basically, you know, when I get an application request or whatever, I need proper information. So that being the metadata of the application itself. As you might know, uh, coming from the packaging world, uh, the information provided by, you know, 98% of the vendors is incomplete, right? You will never find a proper description in an MSI. So we cannot query that information from the packet itself. So when I started out with application, you know, I, you know, I filled it out, but then I ended up having, you know, 50 different versions of my PowerShell script because one was querying 
the vendor and one was querying something else because you know the, the information wasn't complete here right so even if we go into this one from microsoft we don't have a proper description right and, and they haven't filled out the url and the home page and all that kind of stuff so i was just hmm, we kind of we kind of keep on going at this pace if we're going to convert thousands of applications we need a better way mm -hmm. so what I decided upon was to create an XML file because it's easy to read, it's easy to modify, and it's it's good for the eye. You can instantly see what information we have here. We have Microsoft Corporation, and then we have you know the product name, which you can easily find by using the amazing master package, which is free for the basic stuff. So forget about all the. Uh, What's the name? I don't remember the name of the, of the old one we used to use, but after Master Package came out, that's you know, my go to uh, tool. So basically, I just copy and paste the information that I want, and I put it into this simple XML file. Mm -hmm. And you do that manual? Yes, I do yeah. that manually. The product code can easily be acquired by using the tool from uh, Nikolai the one that we use to upload the package. So we can easily go in and query the Intune package and then find the product code. Mm -hmm. But we won't have the description, right? So the description will be missing. The icon will be missing. Uh, if you're using a, an EXE file, which is a bit more complex because we need to provide the detection rule. Because when we're using an MSI, we're using the product code as the detection rule method so that's easy yeah but then you have packages uh like this one which is adobe air and that's not an adobe product anymore it's managed by something called herman international and this package doesn't have the proper detection method because we have exe files that do have a product code because a lot of exes is just a wrapper for the msi and when I do have that one, I just use the product code from the MSI, which shows, you know, an ad removed. But when I don't have, then I need, you know, to find the unattended installation string, for example, and use that as a, a detection method. Mm -hmm. So basically, when, you know, I, I, I start out, okay, I have this application. I don't, you know, what's, what's the description? You know, I, I just Google it. So yeah. if you go, we can use Notepad++ as an example. But check this correctly. Notepad++, all right. So here I get the wiki information, which tells me the description that I want to use. And it also has an icon. Mm -hmm. So then I can easily go in here and just grab the icon. I find the one that fits me best. So this is not proportional. So I try to find one in, which is 500, 500. You know, the max for SCCM is 500 pixels. Mm -hmm. So when I go and grab these icons, I you know take this one, 400, 400. Perfect. I copy that and save this as an icon file. And I, even though Intune support higher resolution, I don't use bigger than 500 because I'm also using the same icon to create packages in SSEM. Because mm -hmm. the thing is that as much as you and me want to get away from SSEM, it's going to follow us for a long, long time. And the reason for that is that the server OS doesn't support Intune. Mm. So being in a in a mixed environment, let's say we we manage to get all of our you know users and persistent VDI to Intune, that's cool. But we still have all the Citrix massive images spread across the world, and when we get new apps, we need to provide those apps and SSM as well. Mm. So that's you know hopefully the the script that went out on the blog post that's just doing uh, Intune. But I have a newer version which also does uh, SSEM packages. That's the reason why you in the XML file here we see SSEM false or true. So that way I can easily create SSM packages as well. I'm going to show that. So very cool. Very so 
what I'm doing is that, you know, you can configure the script as you want. Uh, what we're doing here is normally at the customer, we have an ID of our application. Then we have a media folder where all the crap goes in, readme files, license files, or whatever. Package is the core minimum that needs to go out to SSL because we don't want to pollute our system with a lot of files we don't need. And the same goes for, for Intune. Mm. So if I want to build a package for where are we? I don't remember the Harman code that was up. Oh, I see. Just look here. So I see the idea is uh, 04. Let me bring up PowerShell here. Mm -hmm. Let me cd into that folder. Go. Oh. There should be some script here. We create, as you can see, I have a create application version four there. That's also create SSM. Mm -hmm. SSM table. And then it's going to ask me for the ID, right? So that's going to be thousand. So now it's going to it's going to check the XML file. It's get all the information that is required to build the app. It's going to build the Intune package, and then it's going to push it up to Intune for us. That's and we cool. also have the pilot group, so we can define you know, which which group we want to use to, to test the application. And that's, you know, being a group that I'm a member of, you know, I test all the packages and all the kind of stuff. So building the package itself, when you have an existing SSM environment is easy because you have an existing SSM application, which works because it's in production, right? So you can basically go into SSM and copy the information that is required to build the application. Hmm. So it's pushing it up. So one question: When when you push it up, you you need some kind of authentication, right? Yeah. So, so, so using the Connect MS Intune graph, which is popping up now. There you have it. Need to remember what company I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Nice logo you have there. Yeah, thanks. We need to customize it. Mm -hmm. Make it look good. So that should bring up MFA. What? So I need. Hoping to be okay because I'm in the office. I hear a Norwegian keyboard. When I'm at the home, I have a Portuguese keyboard, and when I'm at my customer, I have a US. <laughs> it's not. It's not easy. Yeah. So when you roam between and reconnect, and you know, the keyboard layout sometimes screws up. Mm. Okay. So we're there. So let's see if we can go to and on. Never remember that. <laughs> they just call it Intune. Yeah, that would have been uh, nice. So at the moment, we need to authenticate, and you know that's you know breaking the automation flow if you want to run this on a schedule, right? Hmm. There is an update to to Nikolai's uh, framework. There has been posted a push, a pull. I think it's a pull. Yep. So hopefully he will fix his module and update that one, and that way we can use an app ID to to, uh, to automatically authenticate. So we don't need to do that as we're mm. doing here. Okay. So that's yeah, that makes sense because otherwise it it will be pretty hard to to have a schedule task or something like that that would grab and uh, do stuff on on certain events. 
Yeah, and, and I'm actually cheating here in, in, in the background because as you can see, I do have the pilot group. But the thing is to get the ID of the pilot group, then you need to use another PowerShell module, which is the Azure AD thing. So you need to authenticate twice. Mm. So what I'm doing, I'm just, you know, putting in that uh, ID of the group that I want behind the scenes. So I don't have to, you know, authenticate twice. And then we have the timeout of the of the beacon and all kinds of stuff. So it's uh, yeah. It's getting better. Yeah. If I now go into air, you will see that the application has been created. The properties. And here we can see we have the name of the app with the product version. Then we have the description, the publisher, the owner. The ID, the nodes, whatever, and the icon. And here you can see we have installation string, the unintended installation string, and the detection method. Wow, that's so nice. That mm. So, okay, how how do we find all these kind of you know strings? That's you know something I'm gonna post in an upcoming post, but we can just. Share with the readers some tips. Mm -hmm. That would be chocolatey. All right, we've heard about that, and that's not something we're going to eat, is it? No. no. So chocolatey is, you know, chocolatey is basically what what Swinget is. You know, it's a lot of products, and they have the unattended installation strings. It's a service you can buy, and so on and so on. And I never manage to click so one thing i'm asked when we go to community tools like this because we are working with applications people are scared of having key lockers and and stuff in their organization's uh, devices so what's what's your take on that i agree and that's the reason why chocolatey have an enterprise version right so mm. they have you can set up a private repo or you can use the, the, the repo that they provide, which is secure, which, you know, have antivirus scan and all kinds of stuff. But, and, and the thing I don't like with it is that it's community based. So if we have a zero day coming out, it could take one hour, but it could also take three days before somebody posts this up. So mm. that being the same for, for Winget as well. And uh, I actually do have a surprise for you with another demo where we are using the Evergreen module. So for the people that haven't heard about the Evergreen module, that's a framework that we have created uh, together with Aaron Parker. Well, actually, he's the one running it, and you know we're just helping out. But what we are using is we are not scraping web pages. We are using the vendor's web page or the GitHub or the SourceForge. And we are also using the vendor's update API. So when you go into Notepad++ and go into Windows, where is it? You know, uh, update Notepad, it's going to send IP query to Notepad to find out if there's a new version. And if there is a new version, it's going to return the download URL. So that's basically what we're doing with, with the Evergreen script. We're using the vendors, and that way we know that it's safe. Mm. Because I'm just waiting for the day that some hacker group is able to upload something bad to Winget or Chocolate. Right? We've yeah. seen hackers being able to, to put in malware into a Windows signed driver. Yeah. That's not a good thing, right? So, and, and and HP had a keylocker in one of their uh, drivers, right? Yeah, I remember that. That's a couple of years. Ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a couple of years ago. But it's it's bad. It's really bad. Yeah, and it's crazy, and it's it, it's getting crazier each and every day that passes. So we we need to be careful. Mm. So okay, so let's go back. I, I found found the place. You you find the package, and then you have files. So if you go into show the chocolate install file here. You will find the uh, the silent install 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 strings somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think this MSIX, so we just have slash X, but you know, get All a right. feeling just mm -hmm. search for whatever you want. 
There's another one, Silent Headquarter. He's doing a lot of great stuff. So he's posting uh, articles with the silent toll strings and also the uninstalled strings. So as you can see here, we have the MSI X, blah, blah, blah. But here we can also find the product code of the app if we want to do a uninstallation or whatever. Oh, wow. The installation here. Let's see if we can find a better, better example. Yeah, you can buy you can buy him a coffee. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. cool. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> NSP, uninstall. You have the MSI. They have another one. So basically, you can go in here and 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 find those kind of stuff. But as I said, I'm going to create a, a blog post. I'm going to show you my tips and tricks. Mm. I'm going to use you know the Windows sandbox and all that kind of stuff to you know. Find wow. Yeah, find this. This, you know, it basically, is, as as you know, this is experience. So when you've been in the game for for quite some time, it's you know, it's it's easy to find it. And if it's hard to find, you you know, you find a way. You yeah. always. Find it. And so, once you uh, you have uh, published that blog, please uh, send it to me so we put it in the uh, description of this video. Sure. Yeah. That is. That there is, you know, it's pretty basic, uh, but it depends. If you're starting out, it could be a little bit more complex. But I try to keep the uh, script uh, as basic as possible, with you know as less information as we need. And basically, if you fill out the XML file here properly, there should be a 95% chance for for the application to work properly. And if it doesn't work properly, well, that's another that's another thing. But you know, let's see if we have we had the config manager one. So what was that one? Yeah, I mean, I could live with a zero point five percent fail. Exactly. But, uh, mm -hmm. If we, if I'm I'm like that. Okay, if I can do the eighty twenty rule and get eighty percent of the apps working, then I'm good. Yeah. Another cool thing with the script is that when we query the package source, if we find an MST file, we will automatically append that one. So if there is an MST file in your folder, then it will pick that up. And that's the case for the config manager tool, because mm -hmm. I want to set the you know the file extension uh, for that one. So that is zero two. And just for, for the viewers here, uh, MST files, just a little small configuration change in the MSI itself. Uh, it's not best practice to go and, and do stuff in a vendor MSI. So you create a MST, MST file, right? Am I right, uh, Eric? Yeah, so that could be, you know, license information. That could be EULA. Uh, I never, you know, <laughs> EULA. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, you know, if you want to have right click or if you want to set, as I did with this MST file, I want to you know associate the dot log file extension to the config manager uh, tool. We already have this uh, tool up here, but we can go here. So we can go to Windows, and we can search for config. Then we'll find the tool and the one coming from me should be this one, System Center. Installed successfully on three machines. And if you see here, we have the MSI and then we have the transforms. Mm -hmm. Another cool thing that we're doing is that we are automatically appending a proper log file. So for the people being playing around with Intune, you know, troubleshooting application installation can be a pain in the ass. Yeah. So when we have MSI, 
we automatically create a proper MSI logging file, which go to Windows Temp, and that makes you know troubleshooting a lot easier for us. Mm. Because we can use that log file as a reference. So a tip of best practices, uh, if you are creating exe files and there is a log, op log option, please use it because it's going to make your world easier. It's harder, yeah. but there are apps that uh, have that. And I, and, I, and I mean, having uh, extended logging, um, it, it could make the package go like a little bit slower, but but I mean, with the uh, SSD disks and uh, proper CPUs uh, that we have today, that's no problem, right? Yeah, and it's going to make your, you know, your work day so much easier. And just a little small uh, comment on, on the path there for, for the log file. It could be a, a good idea to actually put it into the Intune management extension log area because then you would on on the device uh, pane on, on Intune, you would actually could go in there and say, I want to have uh, diagnostic files from this device and it could actually take your application log file as well and give you. Yeah, that could be an option, but as I said, we want to use the same package here for SSEM and into so yeah. that's the reason why we're putting in the in the windows temp folder there makes sense makes sense so as i'm testing you know i'm testing a lot of apps uh, because we're going to migrate from sscm to into right mm -hmm. as as i said i'm a lazy guy so i don't create anything manually so no. if i you know test this stuff i need to have apps in SSCM, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I do that? Well, as you saw in this, uh, this XML file here for this one, I can set true. That way, it's going to create a SSCM package for me. Wow. If the demo gods are with us, <laughs> So that's what I'm working on. That's something that I'm going to release afterwards. So you people can play with that. That's so cool. 1004. Yep, yeah, that didn't work. Why? Because we have to do that from SSCM. Yeah. We are leveraging the, uh, the module. That's fair. There are some code behind modules to be used. Yeah, so let's go into the wind code. Ah, there we go. Okay. So we're going to create one. We're going to create one for SSCM. One, two, three, four. Zero four, was it? Yeah. Zero four. So uh, now it's gonna, better. Yeah. So now what's happening? It's it's gonna copy the package from the package source, and it's gonna copy it out to my software library, and that's the one that's referenced inside of SSCM. All right. So the application is being created. Now it's gonna create the protection rule. So what, what about the application uh, uh, in SCCM or Config Manager? It needs to go to a distribution point. Are you just targeting all distribution points or? I only have one, but yeah, when when I do that, you know, I have, since I have so much confidence in my script and I'm running, you know, running it all the time, I'm pushing it out to all the distribution points at once because as I said, 99% of the chances the package will just work as, mm. as it's running. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, when you're starting out, you should, you know, you should do uh, just a single distribution point. So in my script, you can set if you want to do 
a distribution group, right? So if you want to test it just one, just create another dis distribution group and just put one server in there and, you know, so you don't blast, you know, 10 gigs all over the world, right? <laughs> yeah, it's gonna, gonna put some delay on, on all the services around. Yeah, so yeah. if I go here to air, you can see we got the package created. Great success. So if we go into the properties here, you will see that they have all the information. I have the icon, I have the description, I have the deployment type. Which is on the side. So here you see the content library. Mm -hmm. Remember 004. Yeah. Then we have an installer, the uninstall, and the detection method. Oh, that's and cool. Creating the deployment. So, uh, what we're doing when we are creating uh, this package is we'll automatically go out and check and see if there exists an uh, Active Directory group for software product vendor. And if it doesn't exist, it's going to create that automatically for us. So, we are now moving away from device collections to user collections, and that's all right. You know, we are going forward. We want to use that in Intune. Mm -hmm. As you can see, we have references here. Oh, it did not create it, so that means that there was no. Uh, the thing is with SSM, it's it's syncing the AD groups each and every five minutes. Mm -hmm. So I run it. I don't pause it. So that's the reason why it doesn't show. But I can just go ahead and suffer. And you will see that they have all these software groups. And since this Adobe thing was a new package, it's going to take, you know, like five minutes for it to, to show up here. Mm. But if I go to, for example, iPhone, maybe I have that one. I don't have, it's going to put it in there and it's going to create the deployment for us. So, that's cool. What I'm basically doing now these days, I get a package in the queue. I create the package for SSM only. I test it. When it's tested, I send it over to the uh, system manager for that application so he can test it. When it's verified, they just go in and you know push it out to Intune because then I know that the application is working. Mm. So based upon The blog post that I created, uh, there's a, another SSM dude in the, in the community. I don't, his name is Mike something. He have presented a, a lot of time at MMS. Uh, it's coming up in the blog post I'm going to put out tomorrow. But mm -hmm. he basically used what I created in the first blog post and referenced that one and used uh, querying SSCM and using my, you know, my building blocks as a starting point. So now, so that's, you know, my idea when I create a blog post, I'm, you know, I'm not going very detailed, you know, I want people to play around. I want people, you know, spin their brains and, and that's what he did. And that's actually what I do. So if we go here now, I have all these apps, right? Mm -hmm. but the product. The project that I'm working on is moving these apps from SSM to into. Yeah. There we have another script. And what we're doing here, we have a CSV file. So we're reading a CSV file, which, you know, have the apps. So basically, I don't know if you people know that, but if you go here and select all these apps, and select copy, you can paste that information into an Excel file, and then you get the name of the app. So when I have the name of the app, I can just have you know, a CSV file. So let's say that I want to test these apps, right? So this is the name that's showing up here. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I have some files with version number, some without, some with description, some without description, is that I need to test 
each and every scenario that could pop up on the radar. Of course, if you run a script and there is not a detection, uh, not, not a description, then the script will fail. So I have to check, okay, is the description empty? And if it's empty, then we're just gonna fill it in with some dummy information being the product name, the product version, and so on. And the same goes for the icon. If the icon is missing, then we're just gonna do a stock image. So basically we are using the SSM uh, PowerShell module, and then we are querying the information that we need. So if we were on this script, it's going to read the CSV file, and then it's just going to spin through all the apps that we have here. Cool. And, uh, and out should come a proper Intune package based on the information that we do find in uh, SSM. Hmm. But that's that's where you know that's where I'm spending uh, my time these days. You know dreaming code and all that kind of stuff because <laughs> there is so many scenarios where you have apps which are missing logging for the MSI, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have install CMD wrapper. Uh, there are many instances where we don't have an uninstall command. So if I try to push that up into Intune, it will fail because we don't have uninstall uninstall string so i have to check okay if the uninstall string is empty then uh, create a dummy you know fake install exe or something which is something that you can you can easily spot yeah see it's cleaning up and we should now be able to see a new package and to make it easy for me to find those packages, I think it's called MMS. Because I got the guy, I got the code from a guy who did the presentation of this in MMS, so he shared the code with me. And so the first one we did here with Falsilla, this is a typical example of an application that doesn't have a description. So I just use the product name as the description. There is no icon, so I'm using a dummy icon for that. And then I have install, then install, and then I have the text method. That's what we have here. So all this information is, you know, coming from, from SSCM, and that way you can, you know, spin through hundreds and hundreds of applications. So mm. as I said, creating apps is kind of easy. The hard part is when uh, you're going to test those applications, right? Yeah, so I agree. We have common common application. Whatever is MSI based is pretty straightforward. If you have EXE in uh, your system, that's straightforward as well. But the thing is, when you start messing around with SAP, which has you know prereqs to the, the Office Visual Studio code, and then you have you know you have uh, Visual Studio uh, 2010. So I prefer and I recommend all my customers to use Patch My PC. Mm -hmm. So for the people that haven't looked at Patch My PC, please do. Uh, the blog post coming out tomorrow have a link in the description where you can click because they do provide a uh, lab license now, so we can have up to 24, 25 uh, devices where we can test. So wow. my PC is actually, you know, they are building the pack, the application for us automatically, right? Mm -hmm. And that saves a lot of work. It's a pretty cheap uh, system in my mind, but even though they do have the stuff that they have here. They don't have older version or unsupported versions of Visual Studio Plus Plus. So if you're going to use 2.10 or 2.8 or whatever, you need to create those by yourself anyway. And that's the information you can find in my first blog post on Windows 365, where you can use the XML file to easily do that. Hmm. 
And then there is also the example where you could have, for example, a program that needs a a special version of the uh, redistributable uh, of 2008, right? Yeah. So there, there, there could be a, a list of like uh, 10 different uh, VC++ uh, versions on, on your device when you have uh, a lot of uh, packages. So it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's not easy. No, so, so the only one that is provided now is the one that is supported. So that being 215 to 219 or 215 to 222. That's the one that they have in their repository, right? Mm. So you need you need to do some work by yourself as well. You cannot just you know outsource it, but it's a pretty amazing system. And if you haven't checked it, go check it out. Yeah. Uh, cool. If we go back, we should see more apps showing up here. You can see that the apps are being built out as we speak. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's how it goes. That's very amazing, I believe. Having our config manager apps in Intune. And I mean, how much testing do we need here? Because we've already tested it in config manager. So would you recommend that we do the same install and uninstall test for these apps? That's that's a question for you because I find it pretty stupid that I can install an application through the company portal. I have an install string, but I cannot uninstall the app. <laughs> Why is that? I will have to ask Microsoft for that again. Mm -hmm. But uh, they will say, okay, what are the reasons for your users to actually go in and uninstall your app? Maybe the same reason why we have an uninstall command in SSCM. Of course, they can <laughs> go into SSCM and uninstall the app. <laughs> and yeah. if people you know, okay, we had a guy, he used to work at the design team, so he installed a lot of uh, AutoCAD stuff, but now he worked in finance. So would you reprovision his machine, or should he go in, or should he open a ticket to uninstall those apps? You know, yeah. And how oh. how can I, as as an SME, or, or me as a, as a packager, or the SME at the company? Okay, please go out and test image class. You install it, and now how do I test and install? Mm. You can't do that. So nope. hopefully, they will figure something out. I have to figure out something by myself going forward with this project. But you know, that's. Part of the game. Yeah, so uh, not having too much, too many of Azure AD groups um, with too many assignments, uh, that's a, a difficult task as well, right? So if you do make a required uninstall for the app, uh, then in, in Config Manager, you would have collections for it all, right? You will have an install collection, you will have an uninstall collection, and maybe even a available collection, right? If you if you do the same in in Intune, you'll find yourself in a place with a lot of Azure AD groups, and it's not recommended to have uh, a lot of assignments to different groups with the same amount of devices or the same users in them. Right? There was uh, recently a blog post about how to how to do this and um, why it's not a good idea to have several Azure AD groups with the same objects in them. So um, that's a task. I I would like and to see the uninstall button in uh, in in company portal for available apps. Exactly, and and we haven't even started thinking about how to update that, okay, right? Because with patch my PC, they do it. Uh, you know, they have they are using a PowerShell script for the detection, so they can you know basically do whatever they want to do. And that's how it works with Patch My PC because you make, okay, I'm going to make Notepad available to all users. And then I'm going to set the update, it's going to be a required installation. So if you have Notepad installed, then it's going to install it, automatically install the update for you, right? Mm -hmm. But if you don't have Patch My PC or you have some uh, 
line of business apps, how are you going to update? Because if there is a, you know, let's say a Google Chrome zero update, uh, zero vulnerability, then you can, you know, you don't have control of which user have installed that app and which version they have installed through Intune, right? So if I create a new one and then make that uh, required for everyone, then you, you're going to bloat all the users that doesn't use Chrome because they're going to get Chrome installed, right? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that's that's something else. I need to figure out. <laughs> yeah. So that will, that will be a a meeting with Adam after Christmas, and you know, try to see because now we are starting. We're starting the project to create the apps. Then we have the apps. What's going to happen in of the, the the life cycle of that app going forward, right? Mm. So I have a bonus for you. So um, I did uh, create something else like six months ago, or even more. One of those crazy ideas, relaxing <laughs> in my hammock drinking way too many beers and I was like, okay, let me, <laughs> I want to create a company that, you know, do the application management stuff automatically using various uh, references. And then, you know, next day I was sober and I was like, hey, that product already exists and it's called Patch My PC. So, you know, I dropped that. But at that time, uh, Winget was very new. So I wanted to play with that. Mm -hmm. And I also discovered the XML resource file used by Patch My PC Home Edition. So for all of those of you listening in, if you don't have Patch My PC Home Edition, you should really install that on your PC. That will make sure that all the apps are automatically patched, which is part of their XML file. So what I did was create a POC where I and querying the XML file from Patch My PC. I'm querying uh, Winget from Microsoft. As I said, I don't necessarily love it, but I like it. Uh, and the reason is that I will find, you know, a lot of apps, right? So Winget show. Oh, there's a lot of apps. Mm. Which I and can it just keeps going on. Wow. Yeah, it's big. But the problem is, again, this is uh, community driven. You know, somebody has to do something manually. So mm. basically, what they do they go in and they change the URL to the downloader. Mm. And they get it. So I was thinking, what if I could combine Evergreen, which is uh, our PowerShell module. What is it? Find, I think. Find Evergreen. So this is where we're using the vendors update API, that being GitHub or SourceForge or whatever. So when we're using this one, we will always get the latest version. Wow. And there's probably not too many people, especially from you know your part of the community being aware of the uh, Evergreen module. That is something that we created uh, especially for uh, the uh, you know Cbrix workloads or VMware workloads or VDI or whatever, because mm. we tend to rebuild the master image when there's a new version, which mm -hmm. is the opposite of SSCM, where you know you have the collection and then you target your massive images. And, and for, for those of you who have been working with SSCM and Citrix, they don't actually go hand in hand. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff to think about. So that's how this module started out. So I was thinking, OK, hmm, what can we do? So on my GitHub repo, I have a an XML file with all this information. We have 935 lines <laughs> of information here. So we have the same that you saw in my first blog post where we have the vendor product architecture. And then we actually have, you know, the 
command that needs to be run by the evergreen script to find uh, evergreen. We're going to find Notepad++. We're going to find x64, which is the architecture, and where the URL contains an exe file. So basically, I have you know enable, disable, patch my PC, winget, or whatever. So what you would do is pick up the XML file, put it on your own GitHub repo, and do whatever edits you want to do. And uh, just be aware, I'm, I'm putting this out in, in the blog post as well. This was something I did, you know, six, eight months ago. So we don't have a more complex detection method for the engine package. Mm -hmm. So what we do here, we're just checking if the path exists, right? So I was too lazy to update. But again, it's pretty straightforward. You go in here, you grab these new lines of code, and you put it into that XML file and, mm. and build it up from there. Yeah. So let's kick nice. it off. Yeah. So let's as see you can see, action. we have a local folder. The local folder is empty. And this needs to be run on Windows 10 or Windows 11 because we're going to use Winget. Winget doesn't run on server, and that's the reason why we cannot run this on server if you want to do Winget. And I think that's something that a lot of people want to do because the library is so big. Yeah. So we kick that one off. And then it downloads it directly from the uh, cloud or vendor home site, exactly. right? Exactly. It's evergreen. So whenever you run this, this uh, PowerShell script, it will just check this folder. Do oh. I have Notepad version architect number that matches the one coming from evergreen? If there's a newer version, then I'm going to download 8194. And create a new engine package for that one. Hmm. So nice. it's, it's pretty fast, you know. Uh, I, my internet here is, you know, 100 megs or something. So it's, you know, <laughs> building <laughs> the, the package itself. It's it's much faster than actually. You see, it's stalling here. So I uh, that's because I have a sleep command. So I sign the the permissions and. When I didn't have that sleep command, sometimes it did fail out. I don't know if we, you know, we are querying uh, the MS Intune graph too much. So, you know, just hmm. sleeping out there a little bit. Yeah. So if we now go to Azure. Research for Evergreen. You will well, see well, well. The application has automatically been created with, if it's an MSI requiring the MSI for the product code, as you saw, the difference here from the, the one that I showed you the first, where we have the product code in the config XML itself. That doesn't apply for this one because we are actually querying the Intune file itself to find the product code. So I don't need to have that in the XML file itself. So we find that. So if we find that one, we're going to use that as an unattended string. And we're also going to set the detection rules, right? Mm. Cool. As you can see here, I haven't modified that script. So if I did update that script, I would, of course, add proper logging and QN for silent uninstall and install. So that's, mm. you know, I can easily fix that and call it take me. Yeah. yeah. Mark up. But the thing is here that, you know, we are spinning out new packages here in a very fast manner. And just to give you uh, some, some history background here on this one. So when I started this out, I talked to a community friend and they actually built this out in his company. Okay. And he actually regretted it that he didn't build it out on his free time 
of course, it would be something so awesome to share with the community. But since he was, you know, spending his uh, company time, it's company owned, and they are actually selling this product to their customers, they have more than 150 apps in in the code. They are running DevOps in Azure. So mm. this is building automatically. They are actually charging their customer four euros per user. So right. it's it's basically a, a company built patch my PC solution, right? Mm. And that's the reason why you can see that we have custom IT and so on. So you can basically build this out for all your customers, and then you can just target the tenant ID being the customer in your code. So then, then you can start to build. So if you have, you know, the ten customers that you are managing, then you can easily just, you know, copy and paste this kind of uh, script and XML file, change the customer, and then you can, you know, don't 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 build them by by the hour, build them by the second, and because it's a debation here, right? So we are <laughs> then yeah, them all money. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, that's but, nice. Um, sometimes when you start out with this, you're going to see uh, there is some bugs with Winget because I don't know if you saw that, but when I run the Winget command for the first time, it was downloading a lot of stuff. Mm. That's the one. Um, Winget. When it queries, sometimes it downloads some megabytes, and then megabytes goes into the text files. And since I'm skipping the two first lines of the text files, sometimes I'm missing the version number in the text file from Winget. But when you run the next time, it's, it's just going to work. So, all right. Part of the game. So I go back here to Evergreen. We'll see that we have more apps. Wow. I'm coming in. And cool thing that I, I did was that I added some basic stuff for you guys to play with, and that being team hooks. Yeah. So each and every time when this app is created, is you know, you're gonna see it looks similar to past my PC. So here I can easily go in, I can see, you know, it was created, the version number, the size, the type of the installation, the tenant, and, and the assignment. So you no know, basic information, which makes it easier. If we go up, we should probably find, you know, some of the customers ones that I'm doing. So as I said, we have MSI files. But in some cases, we do have an install CMD, and I want to check that because that this application needs to be looked into because we could we we do have an install CMD wrapper here, so I actually need to go into install CMD and decide if you know I'm going to change it or, or how it's going to work. So you know, I thought it was helpful putting the information out here because as some you know. Automation application creator, it's easier for me to go in here and you know, idea is to maybe tag the the uh, application owner when an application is created. You know, yeah. I have big plans forward. What if what if we could use you know uh, a site so you know the app vendors to just go in and you know put in the uh, MSI file or exe file and. Five minutes later, they get a package which they can test automatically, and you know, taking automation to the next level, or maybe uh, reading the ticket remedy and pulling out the information that we need. And you know, if we can get you know even seventy percent of the application created hundred percent automatically, and maybe do some kind of validation. Okay, if you know this package is too big, or sorry, we cannot create this automatically. Yeah. Mm. Lots of uh, ideas how to to make more uh, automation in our everyday. That's uh, that's super cool. So uh, wow, Eric, you you have quite some 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 things here going on. Winget and Evergreen and uh, yeah, building upon Nikolai's uh, 
Nikolai's framework to upload to, to Intune. Exactly. So, you know, that's that's the whole idea. You know, I, I, I used to be an MVP, and, you know, I, I'm a CTP, uh, V expert, you name it. I've been <laughs> all over. It, it's sharing with the community. So, because what, what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm creating my code and I'm sharing that with you guys. And then, you know, somebody finds something that could be done easier or better. And, you know, they share it back and, you know, we all improve. And yeah. how, how could I possibly create what I'm creating here if it wasn't for Nikolai's module, right? Mm. So all the, you know, I've, I've looked into the various uh, other solution that we have, you know, Ben is working on, on his migration framework. Yeah. Uh, there's other guys as well, but if you go and look into the code, everyone is using Nikolai's code to upload <laughs> this stuff, right? Yeah. So, you know, sharing is, is, is caring. Yeah, it, indeed, indeed. That's nice. So there we have it. And, you know, we should see the apps coming in here in the company portal. Here we see the evergreens. Wow. And they have fine and nice icons. And that's a big, uh, I, I mean, the users are better at recognizing a icon than they are on a naming. So having that icon in there makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I, I think it's great that you make such um, such tool that actually include the icon and, and make the effort for, for having the icon with you because yeah, basically you, you, you look at the icon and you know what it is. For example, the, the true view or the review or design review from Autodesk, you just know it out of the box. If you have uh, worked with applications just a little bit, then you know, okay, that's, uh, that's Autodesk products, uh, et cetera, right? So that's, uh, that's amazing work, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I've been discussing this with Adam because if, now I want to have Autodesk in, in the product name. And it's like, why do I want to have Autodesk design review? It's down there. No, but they know the app based on the name. And it's like, yeah, but they know the app even better because, you know, they have, they have the icon, right? Mm -hmm. So as you can see here, we have the icons. If you're missing the icons, we're using the stock icons as we did in this uh, other example. So as you know, as an Intune admin, I can easily go in, oh, wait, I'm missing an icon here. I can easily you know, replace yeah. that. And what I did to make it even easier, because you have icons like, you know, there's different icons from the same vendor. So instead of using a stock icon, I'm going, OK, if there's not an icon for VMware Remote Console, then I'm just going to use the vendor icon. Mm. Of course, that's better. So, Basically, you just go to the vendor's Twitter account, and then you see the image, and then you just save the image as the vendor name. And if you go, so uh, there is also going to be a link in uh, in the blog post. But I do, uh, I did upload the uh, icon zip file that I have. So there will be a, a zip file here with, you know. A lots of these apps and that was an icon pack that I got you know, mm. many, many years ago when when Citrix app layering were called Udesk. So I got an icon pack and you know that's been following me and we're using that and whatever. If if there's an icon missing, just go on Google, you find it, make sure you save it as 500 times 500 and good to go. Yeah, that's good to have. I can so pack. That, that's what I had to share with you. So there was. Some Thank you very much, Eric. I, I I believe that people seeing this video is going to be a, a lot more uh, expert now on, on on application packaging, or at least they have an idea of what is possible because you made a lot of things possible here by automating and by telling people how this stuff is working together. So if you have Config Manager. As of today, you have applications, 
you can easily do migration to Intune. If you have both systems and need to keep on with both systems, because you have servers or you have some other uh, kind of clients that are not able to go into to the cloud, then you have a tool also to have uh, application importing into Intune and what goes into Config Manager as well. And then lastly, there was a third party update pack or session as I saw it, where we had Evergreen and we have Patch My PC and WinGet. And 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 yeah, go use it and go uh, play with it and uh, interact with you, Eric, because uh, you are into this stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah, is, I'm, is, is, I'm, is, is that correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm all about automation. I call myself the chief automation officer. Uh, I use do a lot of training. I travel around the world uh, doing master classes on infrastructure and code as code. You know where we where, where we cover this one. I was planning, you know, maybe create a new course covering this one, but you know, time is limited. I don't have time doing this anymore, so I just prefer just to to share it out. People go in; it's free. Doesn't cost you a cent, and stop playing. Uh, as I say, okay, all the, the different systems out there is oh, they are awesome. Okay, look here, I can just spin up Windows three sixty five and in has the office pack uh, now what right so whatever solution has been up there is pretty useless if you don't have the apps the apps is everything so exactly we need to provide the apps and that's what i'm doing the day-to-day -day product is you know it's a it's an intune product but this goes hand in hand with with windows 365 as well so the desktop you see here where i'm connected this is what I'm using daily. It's a Windows 365 instance. I get all my packages installed automatically or semi-automatically patched or whatever. And normally each and every Friday I do a, a reprovisioning because it's faster for me to do a reprovisioning than uninstalling all those apps that I've been testing in, um, <laughs> uh, in the system. So I, I did a blog, blog post on that as well. So that was the last blog post that I, I did. I'm pretty amazed by the user experience of Windows 365 how easy it is to, you know, reparation. I would really love to see uh, the possibilities for the user by themselves to reparation those those PCs. Mm -hmm. So that shouldn't be too hard for Microsoft to implement. Imagine you have a user having a problem. He could easily go in, reprovision, put in his his uh, phone number or email, and then get a notification when the VM is ready. Right. That's a great idea. That's a really great idea. So uh, let's uh, let's get that that idea to to Microsoft. Yeah, I'm going to pass it on to Christian so yeah. get it get working. But it's it's pretty amazing now how everything you know moved to the cloud and how how fast the stuff is going. You know, mm. we we get previews all the time in 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 uh, Intune and in Azure, and you know, a couple of weeks later it's in production. So yeah, you know. We did get that uh, that uh, remote help stuff. I think I have that one as mm -hmm. well. Here's. Remote. Yeah, that's the new remote client. No, that's the desktop client. I probably deleted that package. <laughs> yeah. But that's it. Go play with it. Uh, if you haven't played with with. Uh, with Evergreen, so uh, the Evergreen module, go use that. Uh, what else do I have to share with you? If you go to my my GitHub page, just a final tip here. Mm -hmm. GitHub. Because I showed you all the places where you can find the Unintended install strings. And I forgot to show you my own. So if you go into my application repository, you will find a, a ton of applications. So all these applications have all the necessary unintended installation strings in them. Wow. So if you go into FS Logics, 
we have install agent. That install agent is pushing it down using the evergreen, finding the version, and we have the install string here and pushing it out. Hmm. So why do we have that? Well, that's because I'm using that in my automation framework uh, MDT. So when I push it out, just go in and grab the latest version of, of this package. And then when I deploy servers or whatever in Citrix or VMware, they will, go, they will get all those applications that I have specified in my MDT workbench. So if you want to play with automation, so what I showed you today is, is automation in terms of uh, in terms of applications, but I do have a framework. I cannot reach that. So Matthias, you put that into your. Uh, I'll put it into the description. Yes, I'll do that. I'm on my Senate blog domain, so you know I haven't filtered that one out. But what you will find there is a automation framework for building an MDT server automatically. Right. So if you want to play with, you know, operation system deployment, here it is. It's the automation framework community edition. So it will set up an MDT server and do all that kind of crap for you. And then you can start pushing out, you know, whatever you want. It's it's checking what, what hypervise you're running. So if you're using Hyper-V, then it's straightforward. If you're using VMware, then it's going to inject the drivers for VMware and Nutanix, whatever. So, That's you know, cool. Stuff, same stuff that, that Johan is using, but uh, I, I built it out for my training students. So mm -hmm. when they uh, you know, join my training, they just set this up easily and fast and then you know, spend time uh, doing deployments instead of spending time uh, doing this, you know, uh, setting it up. And another yeah. cool thing here is that you can use this at the customer. So if you have customer that doesn't use uh, doesn't use Citrix, or that doesn't use SSM or MT, whatever, you can just put this on a share, and then you can just browse to that install. PS1 file, just run it, and then it will install the latest version of, of uh, Firefox into your system. Hmm. If you're using systems like PDQ, you can also just point PDQ to that one, and then you can blast it out to the whole company. So we're using that at uh, some customers in San Francisco. It's a restaurant chain. So we are basically just pointing to the evergreen script for the installer for Firefox. Then we just target all the the various uh, computers in the restaurants, and then we can push out the software in easy ways. That's so pretty wild. Nugget. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. All this automation, it uh, it makes it easy to to maintain. And uh, yeah, as code is just cool. If you haven't started with automation, now is the time because going forward is uh, it's automation, and if you go to the to, to whatever uh, you know job posting, they are asking for automation skills, PowerShell skills, cloud skills. So why don't do it? There was a tweet today, I think, how to set up a free dev subscription in Azure with up to twenty five E five licenses. Mm -hmm. I can share that with you as well. So for people that doesn't have you know, started playing with Azure and in tune, there is a free option for you uh, yeah. for Microsoft that you can use to get started. Yeah. That's basically, you know, that's the big takeaway here. Get mm -hmm. started. Exactly. Get started. And uh, once you know it manually, you can automate the stuff, right? So, um, yeah. And you have the recipes right here. Yeah, you will find it at my GitHub. So there are also one here for pushing out hypervisor if you want to do that. I had a customer he was requesting, uh, he, he was about to deploy 500 send servers across the world. So I wrote him a script and used TFTP and you can also use that to deploy EXC as well through Pixie if you want. So right. it's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Just go 
they run? <laughs> That's a couple of hours uh, of reading here and uh, going through all the scripts stuff. So uh, yeah. That's uh, really cool, Eric. So I I just want to thank you for for this uh, impressive demo. I I think really it was really great, Eric. And uh, I can see that you put a lot of effort in in what you do. And I can see why people would uh, would uh, would go to your classes because uh, you are certainly a masterclass. So. Uh, Thank you for being on the show and thank you for for showing me and all the viewers and uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll vote for you uh, for a MEP in the future. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, great to join the show. And if people have questions, uh, just reach out on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, go on Twitter. You, yeah. you, know, you will find news on Twitter before you see in the newspaper. And you know it's very hard to stay on top of what's happening. And you know, for me, I, I don't read newspaper anymore, but I do read my Twitter feed, and that's where you know I pick up everything which goes on on a daily basis. So, mm -hmm. yeah, go, go to Twitter, go follow Eric. Thank you a lot, and uh, have a nice Christmas and a uh, new year. Same to you, Matthias, and until next time, bye-bye.